Hey, so in this video, I want to talk about um, some representation theory and a bit of category theory. Uh, in particular, um, so hopefully uh, before watching this, you've, you've seen the definition of uh, an uh, adjoint pair of functors before, but I'll remind you in a moment. Um, there's this important adjunction in representation theory called Frobenius reciprocity. And that, you know, maybe the first time you see that and the definition of induction of representation, like it's not an obvious construction necessarily. Um, but I think there are a couple intuitive ways to justify it. Um, one of the ways I would like to talk about today, um, and uh, that is through the study of modules. There's there's a particularly nice triple of adjunctions that shows up there. And so I want to motivate the definition of uh, induction and, and restriction, um, and ultimately for Benius reciprocity through um, these similar concepts for R modules. So uh, just to remind you, um, a, uh, a pair of uh, functors, F and G, between two categories, C and D, uh, we say that F is left adjoint to G, um, picking this terminology because if you sort of think of the Homs here as like an inner product, it, it's reminiscent of an adjoint matrix uh, or linear operator, I should say. Uh, so it turns out uh, 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 we define these functors to be adjoint if for every pair of objects, um, X belonging to our category C, Y belonging to our category D, uh, if the collection of homomorphisms in D from f of x to y is naturally isomorphic to the collection of, um, of homomorphisms in C between x and g of y. And what I mean by naturally is that, you know, you have maps from, you know, x to x prime and y to y prime, and everything's uh, compatible in every possible sense you would want it to be. Okay, so this is a pair of, uh, uh, this is the definition of adjoint functors, comes up uh, a lot of places in mathematics and is uh, a useful concept. Uh, in particular, uh, what I've written below here, this is what we call uh, Frobenius reciprocity. So it's a, it's a particular instantiation of this. So I'm imagining here that uh, sigma is a representation of the group H and pi is a representation of, of the group G. So maybe you've seen something like this before and you've, you've learned about the um, induced representation. Uh, uh, you know, if you have a subgroup H of G, uh, so very obviously, if you have a representation of G, you can just restrict it to H and you've got a representation of H. Um, it's less clear how to go um, backwards. And, but that's what I'm gonna talk to you um, about today. But before doing that, um, um, I want to talk about R modules in particular. So um, let's suppose that we we have some ring, and uh, well, let's let's suppose um, that I have a ring homomorphism between two rings R and S, and I'm going to talk about uh, a couple different functors between the category of R modules and the category of S modules. <clears throat> so um, probably the most uh, famous adjunction um, that, that uh, exists and is, is one of my favorites is that it turns out the, the map, um, so, so this is actually a pair of adjoint functors from um, R, the category of R modules to itself. Um, so taking tensor products um, of a, uh, a uh, by an, an R module, um, this is adjoint to taking the HOM set. So, so both of these um, return for you um, R modules, and this happens to be a pair of adjoint functors. Okay, very famous, very useful, um, has lots of different sort of instantiations. And um, we're going to talk about a slightly different one. Uh, well, well, we are, we, we are going to talk about this. So, so I should say, um, I'm going to denote um, the, this, uh, uh, well, we're going to see, if, uh, th this is for when we're just going from the category of R modules to itself. Um, but is there some sort of way to generalize this adjunction, um, passing to, if, if, if we're going between different R module categories? And the answer is yes, actually. Um, so 
what's interesting is that um, if I have uh, if I have this ring uh, homomorphism between R and S, and I suppose that N uh, is an S module. Well, this homomorphism now actually lets me specify an action of the elements of the ring R on the S module N. And the way that I do that is, is I'm going to define an element of the ring R uh, to act on some N in the S module N by, well, all that, S, uh, all that N knows is how to be acted on by elements of S. But I can simply apply my ring homomorphism F to R. And now um, I, I already have, because N is an S module, I already have a way to act on that um, as, as an actual module action. So uh, it shouldn't be too hard to convince yourself that this does in fact um, turn N into an R module. And in fact, this process is functorial. So this defines a, a functor. Um, uh, so the, the functor defined in this way um, I'm going to call it uh, F lower star, takes us from the category of, of S modules to the category of R modules. Okay, um, but what does this have to do with tensor product? How, how do we define uh, the uh, more general version of, of tensor product? Um, well, notice that um, we, if we have a ring homomorphism, in the same way that I've just described here, that, that this actually makes N into an S module. Well, S itself is in, or sorry, it makes the S module N into an R module. S itself is an S module. So that means whenever we have a, a, a ring homomorphism here, we can actually interpret S as an R module. And so what we're going to do then is now we can define um, a tensor product um, uh, so let me take this color here. So, so now I can define the tensor product if I have, um, let's say, an, an, an R module B, then I can define uh, the tensor product B tensored with S over R. And this um, will actually give me an S module because now I can simply act on um, and uh, I, I, I can simply act um, just by by multiplying on uh, this factor of S here. Um, and so this generalizes the, the tensor product um, and I'm going to call this one F um, upper star. And uh, these two together give us what's called the extension and restriction of scalars. So let's look at some concrete examples to, to get a, a better idea of this. So um, moving back up here, um, you know, suppose that I had an injection. Uh, as a particular example, let's think about the, the natural injection from the real numbers to the complex numbers. Um, and since we're working over a field, all our modules are actually just vector spaces. So um, this um, being the, the uh, restriction uh, of scalars, it's just like imagining, uh, you know, imagining you had some complex vector space. And now instead of uh, multiplying all the vectors that you have by a complex number, um, you simply restrict to those real numbers, right? So this is why we call this the restriction of scalars. Uh, similarly, um, this is called extension of scalars because if you have a, uh, say, a real vector space and you tensor this over the complex numbers, now this is allowing you to treat all your vectors. It's sort of a formal way that allows you um, to now multiply those elements of your vector space by a complex scalar. So we're extending the field of our scalars, hence it's called um, extension uh, by scalars. Um, and uh, finally, there's, there's uh, one last um, adjunction that, uh, that I'd like to discuss. 
So I'm going to define this to be those R module homomorphisms between uh, the ring S interpreted as an R module and the R module M. And in fact, this defines an S module. So this gives us another functor um, from the category of R modules into the category of uh, S modules. And the way in which it does this is, um, uh, so if we have, you know, we have some morphism going from uh, S into M, um, well then, uh, we define the action of, of S on alpha such that if alpha were acting on uh, some S prime, uh, we would have this be the map uh, alpha S, S prime. Okay, and so the, the sort of big result, I should, I should mention that um, all of, you know, the formal proofs and everything um, can be found in chapter uh, 8.3 of uh, Alufi's wonderful text uh, called Chapter Zero. And um, the, the sort of uh, big nice theorem that we have about these things is that we have now a series of adjunctions. Uh, so extensions of scalars is left exact to the uh, restriction of scalars is left exact uh, to this other um, pullback functor. Okay. Um, but what does this have to do with representation theory? We've, we've gotten really in the weeds here with uh, uh, junctions uh, between categories of R modules. Um, well, this is just, uh, there's some ideas I just never get tired of thinking of, even if it's just a, a, a very basic thing. Um, but it's an important idea about transporting representation theory to the theory of modules. So um, if you have a representation of some group, uh, say G, um, and well, let's just talk about finite groups for now, because there's, you know, analysis that goes into uh, the representation theory of, say, Lie groups um, into, into some, uh, so we have some representation into some vector space. This actually defines, and, and supposing our vector space is over some field K, uh, this actually defines the structure of a KG module. So a KG module, right, this is just um, um, formal K linear uh, uh, combinations of the elements of G, right? And um, and the, the way in which this does this, right, if you, if you just have some sort of um, um, formal uh, uh, sum, let's say, if I, if I write this group action in additive notation. So I'm going to have some, uh, you know, formal sum, alpha sub i, g sub i of scalars. Uh, how is this going to act on a vector v in the vector space? Well, it's going to be specified by my representation, right? This will simply be uh, that sum of the action under this representation of those elements on the vector. V. Um, so great. So, so it turns out that there's this way between uh, passing uh, from a representation to a KG module, and uh, this, this process is, is reversible. So in some sense, uh, the study of representations of a group, uh, specifically a finite group in this case, is equivalent to the study of KG modules uh, for that group. Excellent. Um, because now we know that categories of modules have very nice structure to them. And, uh, and in particular, um, we can now think about, uh, I can sort of give a better justification for the definition of uh, induction of a module. So um, imagine now that we have, uh, you know, a, a subgroup H of our group G. Um, well, then it should, uh, you know, not be too surprising that uh, the, the K algebra determined by G is also going to be a subalgebra of, of the K algebra um, 
uh, sorry, the, the K algebra determined by H is, is still going to be a subalgebra of the K algebra determined by G. Excellent. Um, and now, I mean, what are these? These are rings, right? So we have a natural um, injection from one algebra to the other, right? And remember what our goal is in defining, uh, you know, the, the induced representation of a group, we're starting with the representation on H and we're trying to extend it in a natural sense uh, to a representation of all of G. Well, um, if we think about this, it, we just talked about a way to extend the scalars of, uh, of modules. And uh, here we naturally have an injection of, of one module into the other and a very natural way of extending that where we know that the datum of a representation of H is, is equivalent to a KH module and the datum of a representation of G is equivalent to a KG module. So in my mind, it's much more natural that um, we suppose that uh, that N is a uh, KH module. So how should we try and extend this to a KG module? Well, we use the extension of scalars uh, through this injection here. So this defines now for us a KG module, uh, KG, um, where we tensor over the ring KH um, of, of this module N that we started with. Um, and uh, in particular, we know that this, uh, this functor, so the um, extension of scalars functor, this is left adjoint to the restriction of scalars functor. And what's the restriction of scalars functor mean in this case? Well, again, if we're doing that restriction with respect to this um, particular homomorphism, as we've discussed, uh, simply an injection, a, a ring homomorphism injection, just corresponds like in the way that we restricted our complex scalars to real scalars, um, just corresponds to restricting to those elements of, of the KH algebra. In other words, this, this uh, adjunction of modules that we have um, gives us the following adjunction. So we have HOM uh, KG of KG tensored over KH, uh, with N, M being isomorphic to HOM, oh, I should maybe put this below, uh, being isomorphic to HOM in KH uh, of N, and here this will be M, and I'll just write it as, uh, as KH uh, for the, the restriction of scalars. And in other words, so, so in my opinion, this is much more natural to see why this is the right definition, looking at this from the perspective of modules. But now, when you try and uh, unpack this definition in terms of representations, um, it, it, if you literally unpack this, this gives you back the really weird definition of the induced module in terms of like functions off of the group and everything. Um, and maybe I'll go, if, if you ask me, I'll go into more detail about this, this whole business of, of KG modules. Um, but the, the, the whole point of this is that, is that literally uh, going back and unpacking uh, how you get a representation out of a KG module, this exact statement I've written uh, up above recovers uh, the statement of Frobenius reciprocity. Uh, that is this, um, this particular natural isomorphism. So uh, anyways, I hope uh, that you find this idea as fascinating as I do. And uh, let me know if you have any questions.